Hey guys, so this video is going to be on acute kidney injury. We're going to cover pre-renal causes, intrinsic causes, and post-renal causes of AKI. And we're going to start with pre-renal. Why? Because it's the most common. So we have 60% of all cases in the hospital usually caused by pre-renal damage to the kidney affecting its function, increasing BUN, increasing creatinine, and generally having a bad time. So Causes for pre-renal damage are low volume states. Now, if you just remember this, you're pretty much covered. So low volume states is either through diarrhea, vomiting, so loss through the GI tract. You can lose volume through hemorrhaging. So if you have a big wound or a leaky artery, you can also lose volume through the skin, either through excessive sweating, or let's say you have a burn where the skin barrier is compromised, you're losing volume through that way. So that's, that's what most people think when they think pre-renal, low volume state and those causes. We also have third spacing, and this is a vascular cause of pre-renal damage. So leaky vessels where the fluid is not staying inside the vessel but moving into the interstitial space and not contributing to blood flow causes pre-renal damage. So in this case, we have pancreatitis, sepsis, and anaphylaxis. And in these three cases, we have inflammatory mediators causing the vessels to become leaky and the fluid to not stay in your vessels where it should be. Then we have decreased protein in the blood, and this is again causing the fluid to leave the blood and go into the interstitial space. And we'll see this primarily with conditions that affect albumin. So albumin is one of our main oncotic contributors to blood pressure. And if the liver is the main producer of albumin, so anything that affects the liver, like hepatorenal syndrome and cirrhosis, we'll see third spacing of fluids and decreased perfusion to the kidney, so pre-renal damage. Nephrotic syndrome is here because when we have nephrotic syndrome, we pee out albumin. So the glomerular filtration barrier is affected, albumin can now leak into our urine, and then we have decreased oncotic pressure, pre-renal damage off of that. Cardiogenic should be obvious, so the heart's not pumping like it should be, and then we have decreased perfusion to the kidney. Now the main two drugs to worry about with pre-renal pre damage are ACE and NSAIDs. So let's quickly go over this. We have our kidney here. We have our afferent arterial and our efferent arterial. So blood flow coming into the kidney is controlled by prostaglandins. And what they do is they're responsible for dilating the afferent. So they're gonna open this vessel up. And then our efferent is, the constriction is controlled by ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, so when we have angiotensin, it's going to cause constriction of our efferent arterial. So we want constriction of our efferent because then our kidney is retaining blood and that's good for it. And we want dilation of our afferent because our kidney is getting more blood. Now, if we inhibit prostaglandins with a COX inhibitor, such as an NSAID, now we have less blood flow getting into our kidney, pre-renal damage. And also now if we have an ACE inhibitor, we're no longer constricting this efferent arterial, the vessel's opening wide up and more blood is getting out of the kidney. So less blood in the kidney means hypoxia to kidney cells and renal damage. All right, so we've covered the etiology of pre-renal. Now let's go into intrarenal. Intrarenal is our second most common cause of kidney damage. And I've separated these causes into a couple different categories here. So we have our glomerulus, our tubules, and our interstitium. And I'll also add vascular here as another cause. And these are all components of our intrarenal unit. Okay, so let's start with the tubules. The tubules are lined by epithelium, right? And this epithelium is susceptible to all sorts of things, hypoxia, drugs, and all of these, if they damage these cells, can cause them to slough off and form little granular casts here that obstruct flow. You're gonna have reduced GFR and things like that. So acute tubular necrosis is our culprit when we're looking at tubules. And what are the main tubules affected? It's those really with the highest metabolic demand. So our straight segment of our proximal tubule and our straight segment of our distal tubule, those are the main affected areas because they're highly metabolically active. Okay, um, then if we look at our glomerular unit, we have glomerular nephritis. And this is the buildup of antibody antigen complexes in the glomerulus, which affect filtration. So they're gonna affect your GFR. And if we, we can have a whole separate video on glomerular nephritis, but uh, just to list a few, we have rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, uh, we have post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, uh, glomerular nephritis as a result of autoimmune diseases like lupus. We can even have things like amyloid building up in the glomerulus stopping flow. So we can run through this if it's requested in, in a second video. 
Next, we have the vasculature. So if the vasculature is affected, if it's leaky, if there's plaques or anything, we get reduced um, filtration of, of the blood. And really, that's the purpose of the kidney, to filter out toxins from the blood. So we have HUS, which is hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is a result from our E. coli toxin or our sugar toxin. And then we have thromb thrombotic thrombocytic penic purpura. This is caused by Adam TS13 mutation. And now we have excess von Willebrand factor, small micro thrombi are now moving through our small vessels and they're going to block up this vasculature. Small vessel vasculitis. So here we're thinking about our Bichette's disease, our Churg Strauss, our Wegener's granulomatosis. And these are all, all of our small vessel P anca, C anca sort of related vasculitides that will affect the kidney. And then of course we have hypertension. So hypertension, high blood flow, those are shearing forces on the endothelium of the vessels and they will damage them, which will cause reduced glomerular filtration in the end because of these are very small vessels and they're very sensitive. All right, so let's move on to post-renal causes of uh, AKI. And here we have malformations acquired neurogenic bladder. So malformations, these you're born with, let's say you have a stricture that causes the ureter to be blocked. So whenever we're blocking something after the kidneys released its products, this is postrenal. It's the least common cause, so you're not going to run into it so often. But a malformation in the ureter can cause fluid to build up, and then we have damage to our kidney through excess high pressures in there. Then we have our acquired causes, and these are either tumor stones or benign pr prostatic hypertension. So anything that really can affect the ureter and the urinary tract after the kidney is causing postrenal damage. And so you can see if a stone obstructs the ureter or if a tumor is pressing on the ureter or on the kidney, we can have this kind of damage. The prostate, as you know, uh, affects the urethra and then that causes buildup of fluid in the bladder as well as in the ureters and then eventually the kidney. So a lot of old men with BPH can have postrenal damage as a result of this if it's severe enough, but it's pretty rare. Then we have neurogenic bladder, so the bladder has a detrusor muscle that relaxes and contracts, which controls uh, the release of uh, urine. So in cases of people with neuro neurologic damage, such as multiple sclerosis or a spinal cord lesion, we can have the affected nerves that go to these muscles that can allow for urination to be affected, and then this causes buildup of fluid and postrenal damage. And so peripheral neuropathy is also part of that. So let's go through the um, progression of AKI. Well, we start off with some sort of initial insult, either a drug or a hypoxic state that damages our kidney. And the first stage after that is called the oligaric stage. And what this means is that our urine output is decreased. So our GFR goes down and this will last approximately two weeks. So when our GFR goes down, we get things like fluid retention. Fluid retention can lead to pulmonary edema, which you'll see on chest x-ray. You also get hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis because you're not able to excrete your potassium or your acid, which is one of the key functions of the kidney. Uremia, your BUN is going up, and when your BUN goes up, the urea, urea can get increased in the brain, and this can cause things like asterisks or the hand flapping tremor, as well as lethargy. And after that, the kidney begins to, begins to recover, and generally the glomerulus recovers faster than the tubules, so you're going to end up with something called the polyuric stage. So your GFR is going to go back up faster than your tubules can recover, which means that now you have all this fluid pumping through, but the tubules are still having trouble reabsorbing and balancing the electrolytes in them. So this will last up to around three weeks. So one week later than your oliguric stage. So in this, you'll see loss of electrolytes and loss of water. And that's just because the, the all the pumps and all the water reabsorption channels aren't yet regulated in the tubules. They're still, have, they're still recovering. And so we'll see dehydration, hyponatremia, and hypokalemia. So here we have high potassium in our oliguric stage and low potassium in our polyuric stage. And these are just one week apart, okay? And sodium, it's, uh, sodium is only going to be affected in our polyuric stage, okay? So just remember that as, as a key differential here. So we have uh, hyponatremia and hypokalemia, and then this is because neither sodium or potassium are being reabsorbed. And then we have polyuric stage going into the recovery stage, and this can last up to anywhere uh, from more than three weeks up to two years. So during this recovery stage, GF, GFR is still recovering and the tubules are still balancing these electrolytes back to their normal states. So uh, AKI can be a serious deal if someone's kidneys are disrupted for up to two years in this recovery process. 
let's talk a bit about um, diagnostics. So the key, there are a couple stages of AKI, um, stage one through three. And we'll, we'll mainly talk about stage one because once you have stage one, you can diagnose AKI and progress to deal with it. And obviously stage two and three are worse than stage one. So you can take these as reference values just for baseline function. Um, so for stage one, we're really looking at two things. We're looking at creatinine and urine output. These are our diagnostic criteria. So if creatinine increases 0.3 milligrams per deciliter within 14, 48 hours, that's uh, one of the criteria. And it can either be this or uh, 1.5 to 1.9 times baseline within seven days. So you can pick one, one of this or the other one or both, and then you can diagnose stage one AKI. Another way you can do it is if you see less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour for six to 12 hours, and this is urine output. So what we're looking at here is a table that describes pre-renal and intrinsic as well as post-renal damage in terms of some key labs. And the first key lab we're looking at is BUN and creatinine ratio. And in pre-renal damage, so if we look at that, you'll see that it's increased, that it's 20 to 1. And the reason why this happens is because in pre-renal damage, the kidney isn't being perfused, so it's going to think you're in a low-volume state. And it activates the RAS system as well as ADH. And when ADH is activated, you'll see that the urea in the urine is going to be absorbed a lot faster because it's one of those key solutes that helps to drive water back into the body. Um, so BUN is, and creatinine are both increased, don't get me wrong here, but BUN increases a lot more. Then our functional excretion of sodium as well as our urine sodium concentration are going to be low. So we're not peeing out as much sodium because now that we're in a low volume state and we have the RAS system activated and duotensin aldosterone, those are going to work to reabsorb our sodium. And remember, aldosterone is going to also pee out our potassium, so we're going to be a little bit hypokalemic potentially. Then we have our urine osmolarity. So that's going to go up. Osmolarity is kind of a measure of concentration, right? So it's going to go up because now that we're absorbing all of our sodium and all of the water is following it, uh, the urine is going to become very concentrated. We're trying to preserve volume. Then our urine sediments that we can see here are hyaline casts, and generally these are just tubular cells that slough off and because they're so concentrated together they they form little hyaline casts and this is really a marker for dehydration or poor perfusion to the kidney in this case. If we move over to intrinsic damage we'll see that our B1 creatinine ratio is less than 15 to 1 so now it's going down and why is this is happening is because our BUN can no longer be reabsorbed because our, our tubules are being damaged so in our loop of Henle where our urea is is working in the reabsorption section it's no longer working so it's getting excreted out in the tubule so uh, the ratio isn't as high as it was in the pre-renal case right so we're peeing out urea and the creatinine is also going to be going up but it doesn't go up as much as in the pre-renal case then our fractional excretion of sodium as well as our urine sodium concentration these are going to be greater so now that our kidney function in the tubules is become impaired we're gonna have sodium being peed out instead of retained as we saw in the pre-renal case. And this is just because our kidney function is impaired. In our pre-renal case, kidney function is still pretty much trucking along, but here in intrinsic, where we have damage to our tubules, our interstitium, all the things we discussed before, we're gonna have uh, sodium being peed out. So urine osmolarity uh, is gonna be decreased. And why is that? Because now that we're peeing out uh, all of our, our solute, our solvent is gonna follow with it, right? So our water, it's gonna be pretty watery and all the water is gonna follow the sodium and our antidiuretic hormone isn't working to reabsorb water. So our distal convoluted tubule isn't working in the water reabsorption section. So we're gonna have dilute urine in this case. And what we'll see in this case are a couple of characteristic casts. So if you have acute tubular necrosis, these form muddy brown casts and these are the tubular cells that are sloughing off and necrosing and dying because of hypoxia. We can see RBC casts in the case of glomerulonephritis. Now these RBC casts are just because the glomerulus is damaged by those antigen antibody complexes and there's vasculature is very close to that glomerulus. So it's gonna leak blood, blood into the uh, tubules and into the urine. And then we also have fatty acid casts in the case of nephrotic syndrome. So in nephrotic syndrome, you'll remember that we have high triglycerides uh, and this is theorized to compensate for the low albumin in the blood, but that's just a theory, it's not really uh, proven why that happens. Um, then our post-renal variant is really can be in either direction, up or down. So it's going to be very hard to diagnose based on these criteria. What you will see is that the urine osmolarity is less than 350 and it shares that with intrinsic renal damage. And because the volume is backing 
up into the kidney, it will cause some intrinsic damage. So it shares this osmolarity similarity with um, intrinsic damage. And you'll also see uh, in the sediments are absent because the kidney is not actually affected. It's the, po the post kidney system, the ureters, the bladder that are really causing the damage here. So we won't really see any characteristic casts. Now, how do you work to treat these conditions? So of course, with pre-renal damage, we're having um, decreased perfusion. So you're gonna wanna give these people fluids. Um, and then with intrinsic and post-renal, the treatment is very dependent on their underlying condition. So if, let's say you have a glomerular nephritis or an inflammatory condition, you would want to give things like steroids. If you have a renal stone, you want to do something like potentially lithotripsy so you can break apart that stone. So for those conditions, treatment is really based on the underlying cause. So we have to rule those out with either renal ultrasound or CT scan just to make sure what's going on. All right, so I hope this was a good little overview on uh, acute kidney injury, and I'll see you in the next video.